on behalf of the University of Geneva and the foundations which are supporting the Geneva Center for Philanthropy, I would like first of all to extend my very warm welcome to all of you who are taking part virtually to this event. The University of Geneva has created the Geneva Center for Philanthropy some three years ago. The center aims to encourage research and academic teaching in philanthropy and to make sure that knowledge is transferred to meet the needs of practitioners, not only in Geneva, but also above, above the region of Geneva. After only three years of existence, the center has already achieved many important results in terms of teaching, in terms of research and knowledge transfer. In terms of teaching, we are proud to offer now not less than five different courses covering many fields of our comprehensive university. Among others, we can mention one lecture on the legal implication of philanthropy, another one in the ethics of philanthropy, or a course on neurophilanthropy supported by the Edmond de Rothschild Foundations. In terms of research, we are also very proud to mention the research project financed by the Swiss National Foundation for Scientific Research on the taxation and, of, and philanthropy that is closely related to the report which is going to be presented tonight by Mr. saint Amand, the director of the Center for Tax Policy and Administration in OECD. Produced in collaboration with the Geneva Center for Philanthropy, this report published by the OECD, Taxation on Philanthropy, is the most exhaustive review on the tax treatment of the philanthropic and sector undertaken to date. Without any delay, I will give now the floor to Patrick Odier and Maximilien Martin, respectively President and Secretary General of Lombard Odier Foundation, who are going to present the laureates of the Lombard Odier Foundation Prize for Academic Research in Philanthropy. Enjoy your evening. Thank you very much for being with us. Dear uh, Rector Flukiger, dear Professor Henri Peter, Dear Max, dear guest, it is a honor and a privilege to uh, be here today to present the first Fondation Lombardier Prize for Academic Excellence in Philanthropy. My name is Patrick Odier. I am uh, the senior partner of Lombardier and the president of the Fondation Lombardier, our corporate foundation. Ever since the creation of our bank, that is in 1796, Lombardier has placed a very high value on philanthropy indeed. Alexandre Lombard, one of our ancestors' uh, partner, for example, was one of the first supporters of the creation of the International Committee for the Red Cross, developed in relationship with a number of private individuals at the time and with whom and which we still have a very tight relationship. Today, we continue that philanthropic tradition in many ways, most notably through Fondation Lombardier focusing on innovative ways to support humanitarian aid and education. In recent years, we at uh, Lombardier have decided to go beyond simple financial support and to actively and contribute to the strengthening of the philanthropic sector itself. Sector strengthening, we believe, should enable all philanthropists, large or small, professional or others, to maximize the impact of their donation and achieve their philanthropic ambition. Having a strong professional philanthropic sector will also help to further solidify trust in philanthropy and philanthropists will benefit from their reputations as highly respectable actors who legitimately seek to further the public good. Max? This sector strengthening can take various forms. In 2010, we published a study on the Swiss philanthropic ecosystem and its areas for improvement. And last year, we followed that study with a groundbreaking investigation to the vitality of the philanthropic ecosystem in the cantons of Geneva and Vaux, creating a methodology which can be replicated in other geographic areas to assess the health of the sector. The generation of empirical evidence is crucial to enable governments to set necessary policy conditions and to help foundations and other actors in the sector to make sound decisions regarding their own day-to-day -day conduct. We also believe that academic study is a crucial driver of progress in philanthropy. For this reason, we became one of the founding partners of the Geneva Center for Philanthropy, also known for its acronym GCP, in 2017, which we believe is on track to establishing itself as a global leader in this field. The GCP was a key contributor to our study in philanthropic vitality, and the prize allows us to continue to expand our relationship 
with the stellar team that the GCP has assembled. The prize that we are awarding for the first time this evening represents another facet of our aim to uh, promote uh, philanthropy. We in indeed are trying to incentivize cutting edge scholarship from senior and junior academics because we believe that we can generate new insights for governments, philanthropists, for foundations, and beneficiaries alike. The topic that we have invited our scholars to address in their papers this year, taxation and philanthropy, is a key point of discussion, as you know, and debate in philanthropic circles and in society more broadly. We have all heard critics dismiss philanthropics as uh, simply making a few donations and gaining tax benefits. Indeed, in recent studies, a commission in particular in the UK by Prism the Gift Fund, to which we contributed, uh, these studies found that the majority of the British respondents hold negative opinions about philanthropies despite viewing philanthropic actions very positively. And some of those respondents cited tax avoidance as a reason for their negative view. But the relationship between taxation and philanthropy is much broader and deeper than that. Tax policy provides philanthropists with important incentives to give and plays a crucial role in structuring how, where, and when donations happen. The fact that the OECD has itself launched a new report on exactly this topic today is a testimony to its importance. The submission we received for the prizes have been judged by a jury comprised of six members, including myself, whom I would like to thank, of course, for the time and efforts that they have invested. We were extremely fortunate indeed to be able to create a diverse jury that includes prestigious specialist knowledge in the domain of taxation and tax law, as well as practical experience in philanthropic activities. My fellow members on the jury are, in alphabetical orders, Professor James Andrew Orney, Professor of Economics at the University of California, San Diego, Professor Yves Lukiger, Rector of the University of Geneva, Professor Sigrid Hemmels, Professor of Tax Law Erasmus University of Rotterdam, Andre Hoffman, a noted philanthropist here in Switzerland, and Professor Kimberly Scharf, Professor of Economics at the University of Birmingham. The submissions we received were generally of an impressively high quality, so we on the jury needed a clear process by which to judge them. We therefore evaluated the submission across six, listed, six criteria listed from the highest to the lowest weights. First, the quality of argu arguments. Second, the originality. Third, the significance or the impact of the study. Fourth, the writing style. Fifth, the excellence bonus. And sixth, the suit suitability for an upcoming Routledge publication on taxation and philanthropy. Max? Part of creating and maintaining a strong philanthropic ecosystem is encouraging the next generation of talented thinkers to devote their time and energy to studying the key issues facing this sector. All sectors need constant infusions of new ideas, new perspectives in order to remain vibrant and healthy. And philanthropy is no different. It is for this reason that the jury decided to award a prize in the category of junior scholar, whereby we seek to offer younger academics a chance to make names for themselves and launch their careers and, of course, contribute to the sector. Um, we have three finalists this year. Um, the first is a paper called Aligning Tax Incentives with Motivations for Philanthropy, Insights from Brain and Behavior by Joe Cutler, University of Birmingham. Second, Philanthropy as a Self-Taxation Mechanism with Happy Outcomes, Crafting a New Public Discourse by Charles Sellen from Indiana University. And it is now my privilege to announce the first ever winner of the Fondation Lombard Odier Prize for Academic Excellence in Philanthropy in the category of Junior Scholar, carrying with it a prize of 5,000 Swiss francs. And the joint winners are Karin Honegger, Roman Kanak, Philipp Balziger, all from the University of Applied Sciences and Arts of Western Switzerland, and Alexandre Lombele from the University of Neuchâtel. Four, why fiscally encourage philanthropy? The justifications used by political actors in Switzerland between 2000 and 2019. Based on 48 interviews, this paper studies the concrete rationales and frames used by Swiss political actors when making laws relating to philanthropy. It concludes that many different and potentially contradictory rationales exist for supporting philanthropy and provides much ne a much needed body of empirical evidence upon which to build future studies. 
And the paper also shows that collaborations of several scholars can help to produce great research. Dear Caroline, can I now ask you to comment briefly on two questions and share your insights and passion on this topic over a minute or so? And those are, first of all, what motivated you to conduct research on this topic, you and your fellow researchers, of course, and what are the next steps in this research agenda? Over to you, Caroline. Good evening, uh, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Um, I'm very happy to be uh, here today, of course, and I'm honored. And I would like to thank very much the Fondation Lombard-Rondier and the members, members of the jury for this prize. Um, our paper is the result um, of a collaboration between my three colleagues at the University of Applied Sciences and Arts of Western Switzerland, Romain Carnac, Philippe Balziger, um, Alexandre Lambelet and myself. So, um, you asked us about our motivation. So, what we wanted to do was to study uh, the world of Swiss philanthropy using the tools of political sociology. What was uh, concretely motivating us was to learn more about how Swiss politicians concretely think of tax exemptions for philanthropy and to be very empirical. And uh, this allowed us to scratch, if you want so, um, a little bit at the surface of an overall very positive perception of philanthropy in Switzerland, um, and to show how diverse, in fact, the political discourse in Switzerland about this topic is. We are, of course, extremely glad that you liked our paper. So thank you very much. Um, it has been a pleasure and a great honor. Congratulations, Caroline, and a virtual hand. Apart from the others, from us, you get a real hand. And of course, uh, to you, uh, your colleagues, Romain, Philippe, Balziger, and Alexandre Lombelet. And uh, I'd like to now hand back to the president of Fondation Lombardier, Patrick Audier, uh, who will tell us more about what happened in the senior category, Patrick. Thank you very much, uh, Max, and bravo to our junior scholars winners and finalists. Congratulations for your research insight. In uh, the senior scholar category, we also have uh, three uh, finalists with a paper entitled Who Gives and Who Gets? Tax Policy and the Long-Run Distribution of Philanthropy in the U.S. by Nicholas Duquette of the University of Southern California and Jennifer Mayo of the University of Michigan. A paper entitled Cross-Border Philanthropy, a U.S. Perspective by Eric Zolt of UCLA Law School. And it is my great pleasure to announce the first ever winner of the Foundation Lombardier Prize for Academic Excellence in Philanthropy in the category of senior scholar carrying with it a prize of 10,000 Swiss franc. And the winner is Professor Richard Steinberg of Indiana University for his paper entitled The Design of Tax Incentive for Giving. Professor Steinberg's article provides a robust challenge to four concepts of conventional wisdom surrounding tax incentives for philanthropy, including the idea that tax deduction provides a greater subsidy to the rich. Congratulations, Professor Steinberg. It is now time to also let you, our laureate in the senior category to speak for himself. Dear Professor Steinberg, your paper is really thought-provoking and ambitious. Congratulations. Let me ask you, in turn, what motivated you to take this deep look at the options to reform the tax treatment of charitable donation, and perhaps to add to it some answers about what next for your research, now that you have outlined this agenda? Professor? Well, I couldn't be happier and more honored than to receive this reward. I'd like to thank the foundation. I won't embarrass myself by trying to pronounce French. Uh, and uh, to thank the committee for uh, the hard work, the thankless task of reading all these papers. Um, frankly, I, re I heard about the call for papers. I wanted a trip to Geneva. It's a lovely country. I wanted to go back to it. I had no paper in mind when I agreed to write this. I had worked on taxes and giving much earlier in my career, figured I could come up with something. And then the trip got canceled and I had to write the paper anyway. And so I totally froze, not knowing what to write. I wrote down every idea I ever had about taxes and giving. 
and stared at it for a couple of days and then called my friend, Eleanor Brown, who's a professor of economics at Claremont, uh, and uh, at Pomona College, I'm sorry, and w said, you know, do I have anything here? And she said, well, these are the interesting things that would make a great paper, critiquing the received wisdom and listing all of the options and the new challenges that come with things like uh, donor advised funds and hybrid organizations. So that's how I came up with the paper. For future work, well, uh, <laughs> I got to finish this paper. Um, and most of my work now is on three failures theory and extending it rather than taxes and giving. But it says something about the role of taxes in deciding what activities are assigned to what sectors. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, and congratulations to you again. Congratulations also once again to our winners in the senior and junior category and to all finalists who submitted papers for consideration. All were of very high quality indeed. It is now time to move to the next part to our program, and for that, I'm delighted to hand the floor to Professor Henri Peter, head of the Geneva Center for Philosophy of the University of Geneva. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Odier. Thank you, the Lombardier Foundation. Thank you, Mr. Martin, you're in charge of all Lombardier philanthropic activities. And thank you again to the jury members and congratulations for the winners. Before we get to the keynote of Mr. Saint-Amand, first two, first two words to uh, put you in context. Um, shortly after the Geneva Center for Philanthropy was set up in uh, September 2017, uh, as, as head of that center, I had to set Priorities. I thought that taxes, taxes pay, play a key, um, uh, key hour of key importance in that context. So uh, I prepared with uh, one of my PhDs, uh, Giedre Lady Kitehi Huber, a, um, an idea, a project that we submitted to the Swiss National Scientific Foundation. Uh, to try to get a, um, some funds to fund a, an ambitious research project which uh, was uh, supposed to last four years. Uh, we were lucky and we got it, which enabled me to hire Giedre for that project. Uh, initially, we thought that it would look at Switzerland, but we quickly realized that we should look beyond the boundaries of Switzerland and thought that uh, the OECD was the uh, proper entry port point to do that. Uh, the way we approached the OECD was through the Swiss ambassador at the OECD in Paris at that time, Mr. Ulrich Lehner, who very kindly enabled us to uh, meet uh, Pascal Saint-Amand. Pascal, uh, if I may call you Pascal, uh, immediately showed interest, but want to see a concept paper. So we went back to Switzerland and we uh, worked hard to prepare a convincing concept paper which we submitted to, to Pascal. We did that applying the vision of the Geneva Center for Philanthropy, which is not only economy and, and, and some law, but it is to look at things through a prism, uh, a multidisciplinary prism, uh, including also sociology, psychology, philosophy and ethics, amongst others. So we went back to Paris, and Pascal was um, at least maybe was very polite, but seemed to be convinced that this uh, was making sense, and uh, he showed enthusiasm, and uh, that's the way this project started. Uh, we worked hard. I mean, his team, his fantastic team, uh, worked very hard. We, we tried to help. And this led to this very impressive report, which was released uh, today. So Pascal, uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks to your team. Uh, you owe our utmost gratitude for what you have been doing, and what you've been doing in very difficult circumstances, because frankly, uh, uh, it was not obvious to, to meet the deadlines, the ambitious deadlines that we had set to uh, each other uh, to be able to deliver today, but that has been done. Now, um, we will uh, give you the floor 
Uh, after your presentation, we'll have a Q&A session. Um, the audience is, uh, can ask questions online using instructions which will appear on your screen. Uh, Pascal, uh, as you know, uh, we all know you in Switzerland and in Geneva in particular um, because you are um, known here as having played a key role in uh, the advancement, uh, let's put it politely, uh, the advancement of the OECD tax transparency agenda in the context of the G20. Um, you graduated at the very uh, well-known National School of Administration, the ENA, in Paris. You joined the OECD in 2007, and in uh, 2012, you were appointed to your current position, Director of the OECD Center for Tax Policy and Administration. The floor is yours. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you so much, Henri. Uh, such a pleasure to be with you. Thanks a lot for your very nice words. And, and more importantly, thanks a lot for the great partnership. Uh, you came up with a, a fantastic idea with some funding, which helped us uh, do what uh, we thought was a very helpful contribution. Uh, so I would like to thank you, to thank the uh, Geneva University, the Geneva Center for Philanthropy. I would like to say hello to Patrick Odier, you referred the work we, we did on uh, transparency and then Patrick Odier was a, a really great interlocutor uh, from the Swiss Banking Federation at the time. Uh, so it's, it's among friends, um, unfortunately not uh, physically present, uh, that uh, I, I'm, I'm glad to, to report on, on, on the work uh, we've done uh, together on taxation and, and philanthropy. Um, the um, um, personal experience on the work on, on philanthropy and taxation uh, is, uh, for me, uh, dates back to uh, 2000, uh, the 15th of September, where I uh, was uh, the head of uh, the office in Bercy, in the French Ministry of Finance, in charge of the taxation of philanthropy. I had just been appointed a few days before, and I had to present the reform to a large crowd of, uh, of charities. Uh, I, it was in Metz, in the, in the eastern part of France. And I personally was not that convinced by the reform, but I did my best. And that was the first boo by 2,000 people at once. So uh, today, not being physically present, I hope I will not have the boos, but I think I took some uh, lessons from that. And, 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 and that's one of the reasons also why I was so happy to work on this, to try uh, for us at the OECD to uh, provide for the right advice and the balanced advice on what can be done. So our report uh, done uh, with your support and the support of, of your team uh, has allowed us to gather the information, and that's the value added of the OECD, we have members, the information from uh, 40 countries, uh, from OECD countries and beyond OECD countries. And uh, what you will find in the report are findings, benchmarks, best practices, and, and also uh, uh, trying to become the publication of reference. Uh, and, and this work is not only tax work, it has drawn extensively on the, on the really in-depth work and fascinating work you are doing at the Center for Philanthropy and the University of Geneva uh, on the ph philosophical approach, sociological approach, and, and many other multidisciplinary approaches that you bring uh, to the topic. So I will try to present um, um, what we've done with uh, two, two main parts. One, which is the stock taking exercise. Where, where do we stand uh, today? Uh, and the fact that philanthropy plays a very important role. And I would say an increasing role to deliver public goods uh, in an environment, we're in the midst of a pandemic, in an environment uh, where uh, we can see that uh, uh, the implication of civil society relying more heavily on the giving by the people uh, is even more important. And, and, and the second uh, part of my presentation will try to uh, present to you what are the takeaways, what, what can governments or participants to this game uh, take away uh, from our report. So to, to, to start with, 
Um, what we can see, and that's universal, even though it's different from one country to another, is that the economic contribution of philanthropy is very significant. We're not talking about the margins here. We're talking about a contribution to GDP, which is around 5% on average. 5% um, uh, of the worldwide GDP is something extremely significant. Of course, th there are variations uh, which depend on the culture, the respective culture of, of countries, which depend on the level of social coverage uh, and uh, uh, other welfare states. Uh, now, if you look at the US, where the ratio of tax on GDP is, is below the OECD average, and, and one may explain the other, the amount of money uh, directed to charities uh, is, is, is big. Uh, it's 1.2 trillion. 1.2 trillion, 1,200 billion dollars uh, in 2019. So something extremely um, significant and part of the culture. So economic contribution is, is very important and the tax dimension is absolutely key everywhere. And the tax dimension uh, is twofold. One is the tax regime of the entities, the charities, which will deploy the, um, uh, the services or, uh, or the um, providing of the, uh, of the goods, the public goods. So tax concessions to the entities on the one hand and tax incentives to donors on the other hand, individuals as well as, as corporate. Um, this has resulted in an increase of philanthropic uh, activities uh, over years uh, in areas recognized by, by governments. Uh, and, and here we have seen over the past 20, 30 years, the um, increased pressure on the budget of many uh, governments, which has translated in fewer uh, funds provided to the charities by the government, so subsidies have reduced, which has obliged the charities to go fundraising uh, a bit more uh, and therefore more heavily rely on uh, the generosity of the public, which had to be incentivized by uh, tax breaks or tax incentives on the one hand, and on the other hand, to fund themselves, the charities very often have had to deploy commercial activities which have also contributed to the funding of the activities. And, and doing so, the lines between what is public good and what is more competitive actions, um, 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 competition and commercial activities, the lines have been a bit blurred, which have made the issue of the taxation of charities and the incentives to donors both more sensitive and uh, more complicated with at stake a, a democratic question. Uh, you would think that public goods have to be funded by governments through the taxes they collect, and it's for the people represented by parliament to decide where the expenses, the public expenditure should be directed to, what are the social goals, what are the ultimate goals of a society that's for uh, the uh, democracy uh, to decide upon. But at the same time, and it's not only due to the overall, I mean, lack of trust uh, in the institutions that probably today is at a peak. It's not only because of, of this lack of trust, but also because the civil society, the people, they care about activities which are uh, activities within uh, the um, uh, frame of public good, uh, which may not be the top priority of the government, but uh, it would be a waste, literally speaking, uh, not to direct uh, fundings to these activities, which do reflect the views of uh, the people uh, through other mechanism than just representation uh, through um, um, the parliament. Um, 
So you have different tensions there, civil society versus representative uh, democracy. Uh, you have the issue of leveling the playing field uh, as regards commercial activities, as I mentioned. Uh, it, it's, it's a very simple ex example that uh, can illustrate uh, this issue. Uh, you go to a fantastic museum and, and then you will have lunch uh, at the restaurant of the museum. Uh, it's a commercial activity. Should uh, I be invoiced to that? or not? Uh, should the restaurant part of the activity of the museum be subject to corporate income tax or should it be exempt? And, and depending on whether you are the brasserie across the corner or not, your point of view might uh, differ. And, and that's a, a, a real question. Finally, uh, and I wouldn't um, um, would like to spend too much time on that, but it's, it's an important issue. Given the level of inequalities in today's world, uh, there is a risk uh, of an overweight of high net worth individual in an increasingly uh, unequal world, overweight in, in where the funds are distributed, are allocated. Uh, you may have cases where uh, some uh, individuals have been able to build big fortune and they are usually extremely generous and want to um, uh, spend uh, in, in uh, public goods. Uh, but the question here is uh, the personal dimension may actually be a bit distortive or, or may raise questions, especially when the frontier of what public good is and what is not uh, is, is at stake. We, we all have a few elements in mind. Being a French person, of course, I have culture in mind and then some big investments by French billionaires in culture where some people may wonder, well, where, where, where should we draw the line? So there is a question mark there that we shouldn't ignore, even though this should not overshadow the importance of the sector and the fact that governments actually need philanthropy to support them in deploying uh, public goods. So that's for the background of the report. Then the report goes through uh, the um, presentation of the regimes in the 40 countries I mentioned uh, and, and tries to find the uh, commonalities uh, of these all. But uh, what I would like to uh, emphasize uh, now is uh, rather the, uh, the takeaways uh, for um, uh, the governments and, uh, and other stakeholders. Uh, so the, the main question I think is how to design tax rules which support philanthropy in a manner which is aligned with public interest, uh, because that's the goal. Public interest is to be defined by the government. It's not for private individuals to substitute for um, uh, the uh, governments or the representatives to decide what public interest is. Uh, but uh, then once you fix that frame, how can you design tax rules which will be uh, the most efficient knowing that they are trade-offs uh, and trade-offs uh, between uh, the cost uh, for the government and the efficiency of directing uh, new funding to a number of, of activities. So how do you strike the right uh, balance uh, there? So uh, six main points uh, there. The, the first one is that you need to reassess the activities eligible for support. And here we can see very different approaches from one country to another on whether you have uh, registries, whether you have lists of activities, uh, or whether you have more generic uh, definitions. Uh, but I think if a government would like to revisit this issue uh, because there would be tensions or there would be a need to be more efficient, uh, then uh, the government should start reassess uh, what are the activities eligible for support, making them in line with the overall objectives of the country without being too restrictive. Uh, it's not about just duplicating what the government is uh, already doing, but being able precisely to fund niche which otherwise would not be funded as long as these needs are within the overall um, framework of um, um, what the public good uh, is considered to be in the country. And of course, the definition will vary from one country to another. So there is no uh, common rule, no harmonization, no global harmonization to do there, but rather the principle of subsidiarity. Each country should, um, of course, decide on that. Uh, 
to the um, um, uh, question of what is the most efficient um, together with what is the fairer. Uh, and that's the trade-off uh, you need um, uh, to have in mind in the design of the tax uh, concession uh, to uh, the uh, donors. Um, so here you have two main tax techniques. Uh, one is the tax deduction and one is the tax credit. The problem we see, uh, we have seen when doing this report with the tax deductions, is that they can actually be disproportionately beneficial to high income earners. Now, it's good that high income earners uh, give because they can give more. But if uh, the uh, tax benefit uh, is disproportionately beneficiary to them, beneficial to them, then you have a question of uh, fairness. So the uh, recommendation that you can find in the report, which is to combine efficiency and fairness, meaning that you don't want to lose giving to philanthropy, but you don't want to give too much of, of, of uh, 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 an advantage uh, uh, to some uh, category of the population, the high income earners, uh, a tax credit with a cap seems to be the right thing. It's proportional, but it's capped uh, and uh, therefore um, uh, would combine uh, both objectives. The third, um, the third takeaway is about reassessing the extent of the tax exemptions for commercial income of philanthropic entities. That may sound a bit trivial or secondary, but it is not. Uh, I'm coming back to my conference back uh, in, in, in 1998, actually, that was the date, uh, where the whole sector was extremely nervous because they would be deprived of uh, some tax exemptions. But the reason why the French government at that time moved was because the uh, traditional commercial activities were complaining to see um, non-for-profit organization, that's the French word for that, les, les, les organismes non lucratif, if we can speak French for one second, uh, to venture in commercial activities and therefore distort um, competition. And, and this distortion of competition is good for no one and therefore should be avoided. That said, where do you draw the line? And that's a very fine line to draw, extremely delicate, extremely difficult. If you take the example to be concrete of the small sport club around the corner, which will do one uh, event every year where they will sell some, some beers and some food, uh, you would of course not tax them, even though it's kind of selling food uh, like a restaurant. But uh, if I use the other example of the permanent restaurant in a museum, which becomes I mean, the place to be, uh, um, you have a real question of, of competition. So what can you do there? We, we have a set of recommendations which are fine tuning uh, and therefore not easy to, to summarize. Uh, but uh, if I have to take uh, two or three main points there, I would say as regards VAT, uh, probably not smart to do exemptions. And by the way, VAT exemptions uh, are not necessarily beneficial to not-for-profit organizations because that deprive them for the deduction of VAT. So um, uh, you, you need to be careful um, uh, there. Two, um, uh, um, you need to, I think, make the link between uh, the income and whether it's related or not to the entity's worthy purpose, uh, which may help draw the line. Finally, uh, in order to uh, avoid uh, bothering uh, small uh, charities uh, um, uh, when they do one or two events, you, you should put thresholds, uh, a number of events or, or a threshold of turnover, which, which would give them all the uh, tranquility that they need just to concentrate on getting some funding for their activities, which will not be too distortive. The uh, fourth uh, element, uh, fourth takeaway, is about uh, reducing complexity. Tax and complex uh, have more than X in, in common, right? Uh, very often tax will come together with 
complexity. Complexity in the design of the rule, complexity in the implementation of the rules, and precisely philanthropy, because they need to spend their resource on other things than compliance, must benefit from as much simplicity as possible. Thresholds. Uh, to eliminate a very significant part, which is, you know, what, what uh, communities uh, have in common. I mean, uh, local communities with a sport club or, or whatever association that they could have that's below the threshold and, and that uh, should not be uh, um, um, part of, of any uh, difficulty. Um, uh, reducing complexity in terms of, of procedures uh, when you're above the uh, thresholds. And, and finally, and, and we recommend that uh, um, for countries to consider facilitating payroll giving schemes. Uh, there are a few countries where, you know, you tick a box in in uh, uh, with your employer and, and part of your um, uh, payroll, your salary will go directly to uh, some um, NGOs or, or um, charities uh, is something which can facilitate uh, tremendously uh, the treatment. Um, fifth takeaway, um, uh, which is very important, uh, is improving the oversight of tax concessions. Um, you, uh, I mean, tax concessions are a way to spend public money, uh, whether it's a tax credit, a tax exemption, that's what we tax people call a tax expenditure. So it's taxpayers' money, one way or another, uh, which is redirected. And uh, we need always to be very careful that uh, taxpayers' money is properly used, uh, that it's not abused, uh, and that it doesn't uh, benefit um, entities which should not benefit them. Uh, with a very, very marginal risk, but which needs to be also mentioned, of uh, uh, some criminals using charities as a way to disguise criminal activities. And you even have the FATF, uh, I think it was a joint work with uh, us uh, at the OECD, identifying uh, some typologies of the abuse of, of charities, which is something that uh, governments must be absolutely uh, sharp uh, on. So how do you improve the, the other sides of the tax uh, concessions? Um, a few best practices uh, there. Uh, one is by increased transparency, uh, transparency of the entities themselves. Uh, public registers uh, is, is an idea that may be too French, you know, the French love public registers, but, but not only. Uh, and, and having public registers may improve uh, not only the other side, but also the uh, transparency. And your reporting is, is, I mean, should go without saying. Uh, an entity should not benefit any tax break or any tax concession if uh, it does not do an annual report. But uh, that's something that tax administrations should check precisely to avoid uh, the abuses. Combined oversight is uh, probably a best practice. It's not for the tax man or the tax woman to decide whether an entity uh, is delivering uh, its services in line with the overall public objective. Uh, it's more for the ministry in charge of uh, monitoring the uh, area at stake more than the, 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 the tax man. And uh, uh, as a result, uh, joint combined oversight uh, is uh, probably a best uh, practice. Uh, finally, uh, you need to put a number of safeguards, uh, and uh, I would like to highlight two of them. One is to properly delineate uh, what is sponsoring and what is donating. Not the same. Uh, sponsoring is, is kind of advertisement. There is an immediate return for the sponsor right, the name of which will be displayed and it's tax deductible and, and it's, it's a normal regime. You may give an incentive for that. Uh, donating is, is something different, uh, even though there is some interesting uh, philosophical aspect of, of why do you give? Don't you give, after all, a bit for yourself or to yourself to have the moral reward of being generous, but, uh, but still donating is, is, is for free. I mean, that's uh, 
uh, giving up um, uh, cash or, uh, or, or goods uh, for free, and, and the tax regime consequently should be different. The, the, the second safeguard that I wanted to emphasize, but you will find a couple of others in the report, is that transparency, not only from the entities, but from the governments to the public, is very important. And here I'm talking about tax expenditure um, 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 publishing. So governments should measure the cost of this uh, tax expenditure, the concession on the one hand to the entities and uh, the tax breaks for the uh, donors uh, on the other hand, uh, and they should uh, see what the amount is and make it public because that's a way to track uh, whether uh, the policy is right or not. The last one, and, and I will conclude with that, uh, is to uh, reassess, the last takeaway, reassess restrictions uh, imposed on cross-border philanthropic activities. I mean, after all, we are the OECD, we are in favor of multilateralism, we are in favor of cross-border investments, we're in favor of cross-border donating, we are in favor of a better cooperation between tax administrations. And, 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 and of course, most of the causes uh, which would justify um, uh, philanthropic activities are global causes. I mean, environment, that's global, isn't it? Uh, and there should be kind of a global approach to that. Poverty, unfortunately, is also a global issue. Um, pandemic and, and addressing poverty in developing countries, I mean, should uh, not uh, uh, be limited to the people in the developing countries, but precisely from developed countries. The pandemic we're going through uh, um, uh, and, and the research in, in health uh, uh, is obviously a global cause. I could name uh, several others and, and therefore we need a, a global approach. Of course, it's not easy for a country to decide to give a tax break for a uh, donation to an activity which will be deployed in another country. You always have the suspicion of sovereign countries, and I'm speaking here in Switzerland, which is probably the country the most attached to the concept of tax sovereignty in the world, but not the only one, to say, why would I give a tax break for something I cannot check elsewhere? So um, for uh, these, we think that uh, the conditions for a more generous tax regime, which would take into account cross-border donation, the conditions are met. Why? Because for the past 10 years, the international tax framework has changed from local sovereignties having no relationship with other local sovereignties, with no international tax cooperation, to now a global tax community. We have a global forum on transparency and exchange of information for tax purposes with 161 members. We have an inclusive framework for uh, tax, international corporate uh, income tax of 137 members. All these countries work together. All these countries have now legal instruments to exchange information. And not only bank information from the extremely uh, competent uh, Swiss banks to the rest of the world, and I just have to congratulate what Switzerland did over the years, but this can be also done not with this stick approach uh, or taste, but rather in, in, in a very generous manner you can more easily give tax break because you will be able to get the information from other countries on how this money is spent. We have built this coordination, which should allow us to move to a more global approach where countries share common goals and where generosity can be better rewarded or better facilitated to increase the funds moving into that direction, knowing that these funds, of course, must be in line with the public choices of a country as reflected by its government and its uh, representatives in parliament. So to uh, stop here, I think I've exhausted my time, uh, just wanted to 
thank uh, um, Henri and his team, uh, the uh, um, uh, Center for Philanthropy, uh, all the sponsors uh, and donors maybe, uh, who uh, facilitated uh, this survey. Thank my team. I think uh, Henri did it very nicely, but uh, they were very excited and, and, and I think they they did a good job uh, with your support. Um, and you know what, um, even though we don't have immediate plans to, to continue that work, I'm pretty sure that uh, this is uh, the start uh, of, uh, of probably a longer term project, at least I, I hope so. And uh, be sure that uh, the OECD uh, will be uh, very happy uh, to continue the reflection and the work into that uh, uh, area. So thank you very much. Thank you, Pascal. Thank you for everything you did with your team again, and thank you for this outstanding presentation. Uh, what you say carries a lot of weight. We all know that because the OECD is, is not uh, only a trend setter, but a benchmark setter. So uh, we think that your uh, report will, will be a benchmark in, in, in what should be done and looked at by governance. And the fact that 40 countries took part uh, means a lot. Now maybe before we get into a few questions, we got questions here, several questions. Uh, the first one is, what are the deliverables? What, what You have a report, what else uh, can people look at? Sorry, I'm, I'm, I, I couldn't hear the, the, the last part of your question. If you I'm don't sorry, you, you delivered a report. Anything else that people could look at? Okay, well actually, not much. Uh, uh, we have the report, uh, which is, I mean, pretty lengthy. So I wish you a good reading of it. And, and you will find, I think, a pretty unique source of information for this. And I checked, but I'm not sure that there is any other similar report. So it's it's a precedent and, and I hope it will be a reference. Uh, and, and the report, I mean, may uh, index some references here or there at some other publications, but uh, not much. Now, if you don't want to read the whole report, uh, there is a fantastic blog that uh, Henri and myself published uh, 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 are publishing uh, now uh, to accompany this, and, and we did a, a short summary. So depending on the public, you, you, you have a summary of the report, you have a blog to have the main messages, or you have the report itself. Uh, um, and uh, in the report, you have a description for each of the 40 countries, because we proceeded through questionnaires that we sent to the countries and um, uh, they responded. So you will find detailed responses, which may give you some uh, better ideas of the uh, tax regimes in the countries uh, uh, which have responded to the question, which go beyond the OECD countries, by the way. And there's a policy paper, uh, isn't that, which is a synthesis of the report for uh, busy people. 10 pages, 12 pages, I guess, which is available already. Thank you, Pascal. Now, maybe if, if you were to suggest three points uh, which uh, one and countries should look at as a matter of priority, what would you mention? I mean, in line with, with what I've, I've, I've tried to, to explain, I would say that uh, assessing the consistency of the policy with the other policy goals of the country is something important uh, so that a government a country doesn't uh, end up providing uh, massive assistance to a sector which would not be considered as, as, as worthy uh, or in line with, uh, uh, with the objectives. And, and, and that's where, you know, the idea of measuring the tax expenditure is, is, is important. It's a question of accountability of governments and, and, and relevance of the uh, legislation. Uh, two, of course, carefully design uh, the uh, uh, delineation of the preferential tax regimes. Uh, you cannot go by providing a tax exemption uh, like this. You need to look into the details or you will have problems. I mean, if you decide to exempt all the income by entities because they are a charity, even if the charity is, is, is in line with the policy objective, you'll have problems with the competitors. And, and these problems um, uh, will be 
I mean, pretty, pretty nasty because they translate into the, uh, you know, the day to day life. And that's where you make people very unhappy with the system, as they call it. And, and you need to be very careful in the design there. You ask for three pieces of advice. So um, the, the third one would be about combining, I mean, uh, re reducing the complexity on the one hand and improving the other side on the other. Hand. And that's not easy. So uh, um, uh, these are two contradictory objectives. And, and that's where you need to find the, the, the balance. Reducing complexity is obvious, in particular for the small ones. And, and for the bigger ones, where the tax expenditure is likely to be significant, you need a good, uh, you need a good oversight, uh, which should not be too intrusive, uh, but should be combined between the relevant ministries and, and the tax administration. Thank you. Yedre. We have a question coming from Brazil. Is there any global research on the size of philanthropy in each country economy and how much tax incentives play part in it? So the answer to my knowledge is no. Uh, you may have more or less transparency from one country to another, but global, that's the word I, I heard from the question. No, there is no global research. Maybe this question is a fantastic one uh, for our next project, uh, which would be to try to evaluate uh, for all countries and, and then do, do the benchmark. But no, there, there is no such thing, which is interesting. We're talking about 5% of the, of, of the world GDP, as I mentioned in the introduction. And, and the level of knowledge uh, is actually pretty small, uh, pretty limited. Uh, it's an area um, where people are not necessarily clear. It was interesting, by the way, when we circulated the questionnaires, our own interlocutors were tax officials from the government had to do serious research. And doing the research, they sometimes realized that the regimes were all but clear. Uh, so you can see that uh, better understanding uh, what's going on uh, may be the first step to take. Thank you. Another question. The report highlights a series of recommendations and points to which the countries should pay attention. Do you believe that one size fits all or that each country may opt for a different solution? So clearly, no, no one size fits all. Okay, each country has its own tax system and, and you, we always need to keep in, in mind that the tax system comes second. It comes after the social choice of a country. Each country decides what its social model is. The tax system comes second to fund a social model. And social models are extremely different. If you take OECD countries, which are more or less comparable, you will have a ratio of tax on GDP varying from 17% in Chile to probably close to 48 or 49 percent to the world champions, which are the French on tax, as always, right? Uh, so uh, the, 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 the public um, uh, choices are not the same, and therefore the policies uh, cannot uh, the same. There are common goals, though, uh, I think, which are about increasing the level of giving while limiting the fiscal cost uh, and, and managing the distributional and democratic impact. So these are common constraints on the design of the policies, but the policies may vary from one country to another, depending on, on what are the areas which need more funding or funding coming spontaneously from the population rather than transiting from the tax system. It depends on the, on the social uh, um, and, and, and healthcare uh, system of the country, the welfare state, uh, depending on the level of welfare state, you will direct or not funds uh, to, to these activities. So no size uh, fits all. Uh, what, what, what is common though is filling the gaps. Thank you, Pascal. Now, uh, it seems that it would make sense to pursue the conversation. That, do you think that the OECD could play a role and, and if so, how? Well, I would like to, to return the question to, to you uh, because you've, you've taken the lead on, uh, on, on these issues of, of philanthropy and, and we would be happy to assist uh, there. So, uh, yes, I think there is more work to do. One, because the level of knowledge is still limited. So you can see that, I mean, um, uh, data 
findings uh, is something which we could do to have more granular benchmark for countries also to be more alert to uh, the issues. Uh, we could organize more of a conversation between countries for them to exchange on the best practices. Also for them to see what mechanisms could be in place to facilitate the cross-border um, mechanisms uh, to facilitate a donation. Also, we have that, uh, but the risks, because it's by fighting the risks of abuse and so that you secure uh, the 90% of, of, of the safe uh, activities. So there are many uh, areas uh, where I think we could do further work. Uh, uh, the team was fascinated by this exercise, so was I, but uh, the member countries, we have a working party of tax policy makers, and I think they did react pretty well uh, when we send them uh, another questionnaire, because, you know, the way we work at the OECD when we start examining a new area is we send a questionnaire. Now, if you're the tax uh, person in an administration, you may sometimes be tired by, oh, another 40 page long questionnaire from the OECD. Am I paid to respond to the OECD? And then the, 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 the level of response was, was pretty high and the level of interest too. So yeah, I think there is uh, room. And, and if I may add one last point there, um, you know, the OECD is made of 37 member countries, Switzerland being uh, one, one of these uh, members, of course. But actually on tax, we've been able to, to grow, to become probably much more relevant than just the OECD membership, which represent 55% of the worldwide GDP. We have now, I mentioned the numbers, 161 countries in a body, 137 countries in another body, and, and all these countries are ready to work together on both best practices, exchange of information, and also reflection on the uh, design of, of policies. So I think we should take advantage of this more global membership uh, to, to work on this. I'm pretty sure that developing countries, of course, have another perspective on these issues, uh, because first they are, I mean, the recipient of, of, of funds, of assistance, uh, of donations, uh, but also because they may face some issues of inequalities within the country. So you have interesting perspectives there that uh, we should uh, take into account. Thank you, Pascal. So it's, it's really, again, uh, uh, confirmation that it's, it's, to do that needs to act as partners between countries, you and, and us, we can bring a little part, but you, you, are, you are key uh, if we were to pursue the, the exercise. Now, maybe one point before Gedre comes with other questions, because we have many questions coming in, but you mentioned the need to get access to data, therefore to transparency. Would you say that transparency is a key driver if that sector uh, is willing to build a trust, and trust sees, uh, seems, as you said, to be, to be necessary? In, in this field? I, I would think so. Uh, and it's, it's, it's both ways. It's a two-way street. Uh, transparency is from the charities because they benefit taxpayers' money and therefore they have to be accountable for that. Let's not forget the key principles of democracy. And consent to tax includes a right to know how tax is spent. Uh, and, and that's why people have representatives in parliament. I mean, it comes from, from all that. So uh, transparency from them, but also transparency from the governments on, on, on how they spend the money. Uh, so the recipients, but also uh, the, 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 the one providing the, the, the break. So I, I think this transparency uh, is necessary, one, to assess the policies uh, for democracy to be properly exercised. Uh, and, and also to avoid, I mean, the risks of, of abuses or the risk of misuse. The, the, the problem very often when you don't have the proper monitoring is that things will never be watched. They will never be monitored. And, and, and they become so wrong at some point that you have a scandal. You have people waking up and say, but that's wrong. We're doing the wrong thing. And then you have a damage to the whole sector, which is extremely unfair. So the transparency is a way to, uh, to secure a smooth running of, of all uh, this, yeah. Now we have a question from Geneva. Um, now that fiscal reflection, uh, reflection sorry, is called for to kickstart the world economy post-COVID-19, do you see changes in taxation rules to incentivize more donations? 
That's a good question. I don't have the answer. Uh, you, you could have, I mean, the question could be formulated uh, on the exactly opposite manner to say, given the deficits, given the uh, um, uh, need for governments to pay the debt back, uh, won't they be uh, more restrictive on the tax breaks they will provide uh, to sectors that they may not consider as urgent as, uh, as, as other would think uh, they are. Um, so it could go both ways. The, the way not to respond the question, because I'm also good at not responding questions, would be to, to say uh, the OECD recommendation to governments right now is don't rush to fiscal consolidation. We have been through and we still are through the worst crisis for probably more than a decade. I mean, we thought that 2008 was the worst since uh, 1929. We may actually, I mean, beat the record here. So it's, it's, it's really bad. We're still in the crisis and it's very important that governments don't rush to fiscal consolidation. Now, would we extend that and say, well, don't rush to fiscal consolidation and give tax concessions to everyone or broader tax concession? I, I'm not sure we would move into that direction either. So uh, no, targeted, targeted uh, assistance. I mean, probably there will be questions on health uh, uh, and the healthcare system. Uh, is it uh, good enough? Is it well-funded enough? Should, shouldn't government facilitate the funding of that sector? Probably this issue will, bo will be more um, uh, critical in many countries with maybe some moves. But no, I, 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 I think that uh, no status quo, but, but no big policy change there uh, is what we should probably expect. Thank you. And another question. Have you identified some countries which you would consider quite exemplary in their practices? I must say that I should ask the team there. Unfortunately, I mean, I'm their speaker today, so I don't have the granular approach that they may have. But no, I mean, we don't have a conclusion from the report saying, oh, look, here is the post child of philanthropy. This is the right thing to do. Clearly, the US is the country where you have the most and where philanthropy is, is the largest, but it's not because of tax. Or maybe paradoxically, it's because tax is rather low in the US or the, the weight of, of tax on GDP is very low because it's a, it's a society which probably calls for more private actions based on the freedom of the people and tax being considered as an infringement on the freedom. So uh, you, you, you may have that, that dimension uh, playing uh, fully in, in the US. But no, I'm not sure there is one post child. There are more or less good regimes here or there. Uh, and that's where probably we should uh, uh, continue the work and be more granular in the description because the devil, of course, as everywhere else, it's is in the details um, uh, there. I, I mentioned the exemption of commercial activities sounds, uh, or the issue of, of the tax treatment of commercial activities of, of, of charities and, and philanthropy entities, philanthropic entities. Uh, it's, uh, it's an extremely delicate thing to design because it depends on the legal environment. It depends on the, on, on the, on the economic environment of the country. We did work not long ago with Colombia on that. Uh, and Colombia, I mean, that was a complete mess and we had to clean it, I mean, to help Colombia clean it up. Uh, now maybe they have a good regime. I hope so. I hope our advice was good. But but no, I, I, I think you will find different elements, more or less good in different countries. No poster child. Thank you. Thank you, Pascal. And what comes out of our research program here is, is the same thing. So there's been no in general, in any country, in-depth research, you know, from scratch as to how to build up a, a the ideal system. So it's more an opportunistic uh, approach, which you know has developed somehow. So maybe that what you've been providing now will show you and and lead people to to think more systematically, and uh, and try to uh, modelize what could be the best solution. Even though, as you said, there is no ideal solution uh, which would fit all. We have many questions. Let me take one which is uh, interesting. 
having heard that, you suggest to have a cap. So the, the question is, wouldn't it be more efficient to allow for unlimited deductions but to allow the government to have a say on the use of the money above a certain threshold. Now, it's a funny question. Does it make sense? What do you say? Uh, I'm not sure I'm the best place to respond to that question, but no, I, I don't think that's the idea. The idea is not for the government to substitute and decide that above a certain level, the government will decide how to allocate the fund. That's precisely contrary to the idea of philanthropy. Uh, or, to put it otherwise, it has a name. If government decides how to allocate the fund, it's a tax. That would be a voluntary tax. There is no such thing as a voluntary tax. So if you think that beyond a certain level, it's the government which has to decide how to allocate the fund, make it a tax, which means that you don't deduct. So the idea that you would deduct up to a certain level and beyond the level, it's the government which decides the allocation is a bit a contradiction in, in, in its own terms. Uh, absolutely. And now another one, uh, which is why do you say that the definition of public good is an exclusive government task? This is a common effort in which civil society has a very important role. So is it an exclusive task of governments? That's a very good question, and, and it's a philosophical question. Um, when it is about public policies, like providing exemptions, which means using taxpayers' money, because a public expenditure, uh, uh, even a tax expenditure, is, is a way to uh, use taxpayers' money, even though you don't have cash coming out of the uh, uh, coffers of, of the government. When it's about public policies, it is for the government's large meaning. I'm not talking about the executive branch, I'm talking about the state institutions, so the government and the parliament, to decide. Now, uh, they have to decide this. Now, civil society, of course, has to reach an understanding and probably influence what the understanding of a public uh, good is. So I, I think we, we, we should not confuse who has to decide institutionally what is eligible, and that's the public institutions, because it's about the laws, and, 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 and who shapes the common understanding of, of public goods. Of course, it's not for the government to decide in terms of, of, of understanding what the society should look like. It should reflect the people, but that's the whole issue of democracy, of representativity. So you need to to find both ways, thus the very important role that um, uh, NGOs, civil society have to play in the shaping of the common understanding in the lobbying of governments and, and decision makers on, on how to allocate the fund, but at the end of the day, it's for the uh, representatives of the people to decide. Thank you. Yedre. One more question coming from South Africa. In general, how successful are tax incentives to encourage philanthropy in case of companies, so for corporate uh, philanthropists. Have you been able uh, to study this subject? Or, uh, do you have any results? We, we haven't got into, I think, enough details to uh, provide a response to this, uh, to this question. Um, I, there are different regimes. Uh, there is also sponsorship versus pure donation. Uh, so, no, I'm not able to, to respond to that. That's a very good question. I'm not able to, to provide uh, the right uh, answer. Or if I may, I mean, unfortunately, companies have too many other opportunities to reduce their tax burden uh, than looking at philanthropy first. So the main task currently I'm engaged on is how we fix international tax rules so that the profits of multinational companies don't shift too easily to tax havens uh, but but stay in the countries where they where they should be. So uh, it's 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 marginal. Uh, I don't have the answer, but 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 definitely it's 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 a marginal question. Oscar, thank you. Because of uh, the time we allocated ourselves, uh, we have many other questions. Unfortunately, uh, they will be um, raised as on another occasion, or the, anyone can contact us. Our rector will close. Thank you a lot, Pascal.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pascal. It was really a wonderful uh, conference. I think it was a perfect illustration of what we would like to, to do at the Geneva Center for Philanthropy. First of all, it's a center for multidisciplinary approach of philanthropy. It's a, it's a center devoted also to research. It's a center devoted also to having a global view on what is philanthropy today, and uh, also a center which needs to work with international organizations. So I'm not going to be very long, but just I would like to thank very much all the, the team who worked very hard today to, pre, to prepare this conference. I would like also to thank very much the uh, Foundation uh, Lombardier for their first prize in philanthropy. And please join us at the uh, website of the Geneva Center for Philanthropy. You will find all the research which is done there the courses which are given here in Geneva, and uh, the links with the uh, question for, for society and, uh, and research and education. So thank you very much, all of you. Stay health, healthy, as we say, and uh, hope to see you very soon again. There were many people from all over the world. We lost the physical contact with you, but we gain in terms of uh, impact, having the capacity to, in fact, uh, having an impact on all over the world, people coming from South Africa, from Australia, from Canada, from US, and from Europe, and from Geneva. So thank you very much, everybody. Have a good night.